Father God, we lift up this time to you. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to spread your word, Father. And we ask you, Lord, to anoint Brother Jacob to speak words of truth, words of encouragement, Lord, from your Holy Spirit. And we ask you, Lord, that you would open our hearts, our minds, to receive what it is you want us to know today, Lord God. And we pray, Lord, that anyone listening, Lord, that doesn't know you will be moved, Father, to to know more about you and to call out to you for salvation through your son, Jesus, and the blood that he shed on the cross for all of us. Father, we pray that the enemy, Lord, would be far from us during this time. Yes. That we get a successful recording, Lord, and that people would be able to hear it and share it and be encouraged by it, Father. And we pray, Lord, that you would just bless this time. In the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Jacob, brother, it's over to you. Throwing up vine acting and happy Christmas, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you so very much. Well, God bless everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to do a teaching we do every year at this time of year, um, but we'll preface it with a few things. Uh, what I always point out this time of year is second uh, is Colossians chapter 2. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verses uh, 17 to 19. Have I lost a connection with everyone? No, you're still there, Jacob. Okay, because I've lost the image. Um, Colossians chapter 2, 17 to 19. We're told, we're commanded in the imperative, let no one therefore act as your judge in regard to a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath. These things are a shadow of what is to come. The substance belongs to Christ. We're not to let anyone judge us as to if we observe the nativity or not. No one knows what year, let alone what day it was. There are many educated guesses, speculations, but nobody knows. We do know that the 25th of the Roman month Saturnalia, it had been a pagan holiday, but we also have to understand something else. You'll find people saying, well, it's the nativity, but it's not in the Bible what it is. We're doing something unscriptural that's not specifically recorded. I've heard even saved Christians say that, and they're very anti-observance of, of Christmas. Well, let's look at Romans chapter um, 14, verses 4 and 5. We're, we're told the opposite. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls. One man esteems one day one another. Let each be convinced in his own mind. It's a matter of personal choice and of culture if you observe these things. But what do we say to Christians who say, well, the nativity is in the scripture, but the day isn't. Why are we observing doing something unscriptural? Now, I don't care if somebody observes Christmas or not. What I do say is observe the nativity. Do it unto the Lord or don't bother with it. The world is, of course, commercialized it to the point that it's, 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 it's absurd, not to mention the pagan traditions associated with it. You should worship under every green tree, things like that. But let's look at this. What do you say? Well, last week in our Bible study, we looked at John chapters 9 and 10. Jesus observed Hanukkah. Hanukkah is on the corresponding Hebrew month by the lunar calendar to December, the 25th of Kislev. 25th of Kislev, corresponding to December, broadly speaking. You can get a day differential because of the lunar and solar calendars the Gregorian and the, and the Hebrew lunar solar calendar, it's not the same day every year by our calendar, but the two months are, are, are basically the same, and it's the 25th. Why did Jesus celebrate a feast that's not prescribed for the Jews to celebrate? In Leviticus 23 and 24, God never commanded to celebrate Hanukkah. Or why did Esther and Mordechai Celebrate the Feast of Purim on the 14th of the Hebrew month of Dar, at the end of winter, beginning of spring. Why did they do that at the end of the winter? That's not in Scripture to do that, but God put it in his word. They are making an argument that is not scriptural. You know, they, they take this very true premise that we should not 
do things that are not scriptural and we should only stick to the word of God and judge everything scripturally. Well, they're correct in principle, but they're wrong in praxis. They don't understand that there is a scriptural basis to observe days that are not specifically commanded for observation in Christmas, uh, in, in, in scripture, such as Christmas. There's a whole other issue with Easter. I find Easter more irritating because we know when that was, and it was not Easter Sunday he rose, and it was not Good Friday he died. He rose from the dead on Yom Rishon of Hagmatzot, of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and he was crucified on the Paschal Eve. We're told that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and 1 Corinthians, we're told when these things happened. Um, and the church changed it to the Quadridecemian Schism to correspond to the pagan feast after the vernal equinox. Easter I have more of a problem with because Scripture does give us the exact day. Even in the New Testament, we have the exact day in five different books. But Christmas, that's another question. Let's go back, first of all, though, to the 5th century, the 5th century. The 5th century was a time where Christianity itself began going into decline after the time of the emperors Constantine and Justinian. It began to blend with paganism. One of the things that would happen in the 5th century took place in Ephesus, where the attributes of Diana of Ephesus, this queen of heaven, were ascribed to Mary, the mother of Christ. The paganization of the church that ended up in Roman Catholicism and Greek, Greek Orthodoxy gained major momentum in the 5th century, and Ephesus was the center of it. Well, the last pagan persecution in Ephesus the last pagan persecution was also in the earlier 5th century. It's very interesting to me that once persecution ended, the church began to get corrupt. This speaks to why God allows persecution in part. Uh, only the true faithful believers will be willing to be persecuted. The others will not. They'll compromise. They're compromising now. Uh, God allows persecution now. It's most unfortunate. Jesus said it comes from Satan. He made that very clear when he spoke to the church of Smyrna, and Jesus said, said it. It was from the devil. But God allowed it. Um, in a persecution, it's those who don't need to be persecuted who are persecuted first and worst. But it shows the wheat from the tares. It gets rid of the dead wood. It purifies the true church and identifies the harlot church. Well, that's what happened in Ephesus in the 5th century. Why do I bring it up? The final senior pastor, they were translated bishop, but it's the Greek word episkopo, episkopo, the overseer of the flock, episkopos, like telescope, microscope, epi, around. The last senior pastor during the last persecution was someone called Nicholas, Nicholas, now, at that time, this area of coastal Turkey was, of course, Greek. It was Greece. Nicholas was a man who was known for his kindness to children and also for his outreach to sailors. Ephesus had been a port city. Now it's silted in. The, the, the port area where it was is silted in. The, the ruins at Ephesus are now about a mile inland east of the Mediterranean. There is a port nearby called Kusidisi, Kusidisi, but there is no port in Ephesus itself. There's a Muslim village named Serchuk, and then there's Ephesus, but there's no port. It's all under the silt. Most of the city has been excavated, though, or at least the most biblically significant areas. Now, what am I talking about this for? Well, okay, you had this guy named Nicholas, and he tried to provide leadership to the church when it was being persecuted. And he was standing at a time when paganism first began getting into the church. And he uh, was in a real weird situation because Constantine made Christianity the religion of the empire. But Christianity turned into Christendom. But still there were persecutions even afterwards. 
The laws were on the books protecting Christians, but the way the laws were applied was something different. That's today. Uh, Canada is officially a democracy with freedom of religion. You've got situations in Canada. There was one case where a pastor was fined $15,000 in the Western provinces of Canada, and all he did was read from the Book of Romans, Chapter 1, about homosexuality. And he was charged with a hate crime, and they fined him $15,000. That was some, some years ago already. Uh, Sweden has had episodes like this as well. Um, Christian bake shops owned by Christians were shut down in the States in major litigations. So although the laws are on the books protecting the rights of Christians, you had hate groups persecuting them, using law and using politics to persecute them anyway, even though technically the laws protecting them were on the books. Sound familiar? Well, that's what's happening now, and that's what's going to continue to happen before Christ comes. Maybe periods of respite on an interim basis, but that's what happened in the 5th century. Well, let's look at this now about Nicholas. Okay, so you have this Nicholas, and he was the pastor, and he was known for his love of children and for his care for the poor. And he was persecuted. He was actually put in prison by local authorities, not by the imperial authorities, but by the local authorities. He was imprisoned at one point. And the people in the Greek Orthodox Church look upon him as a saint, the way people in England talk about St. George killing the dragon or things like that. Um, okay, there was this historical Nicholas. Somehow, he evolved into something he never was. In Holland, Father Christmas, or Santa Claus, if you will, are two different figures. Father Christmas and Santa Claus are one figure. St. Nicholas is the other. There's a kind of a Christmas celebration for little kids on the 14th of December, the feast day of St. Nicholas, and he comes dressed like a bishop with his black helper, Black Pete, and he comes on a steamship and he brings presents for kids. In the English-speaking world, they became conflated. Santa Claus, Father Christmas, St. Nicholas, they all became the same figure. And all this stuff gets mythologized. You've got to go back to the origin to see what it is. Christianity, observed biblically, is no different. The culture has obscured the real reality. I don't mean the culture of the world. We all know about, before COVID at least, Macy's in New York and, uh, you know, Selfridges in London and things like that. We all know about that stuff. <clears throat> I'm talking about the ecclesiastical culture, the culture in the church. It is pathetic what happens. They tell the people the sermon will be the Christmas story. Now, the Christmas story of the angel Gabriel coming to Mary and Jesus being born in a manger, put in a manger when he was born, and the shepherds and, and, and the star from heaven and these things, they're all true but they're not correctly understood. To tell that story in Sunday school to little kids about the shepherds and the wise men who came afterwards and, and you know, Mary and Joseph and, and Gabriel, little children listen with fascination, and they should. But that's for children. We're not children. What is the Lord saying to us through the nativity narratives that we have prophetically in the Old Testament, particularly Isaiah, Micah, <coughs> but also in two of the Gospels, Luke and Matthew? What is God saying to us? Christmas is not simply about the past. 
In fact, it is not even mainly about the past. When we study the nativity, we are studying the future. We are looking at what is happening now and what is going to happen. To understand this, we should perhaps begin in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. Turn with me, please, to the book of Isaiah. <laughs> Chapter 9, a well-known passage sung at Handel's Messiah. For to us a child is born, in verse 6, a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now these are terms of divinity. Wonderful Counselor, Pele Yoetz, Pele Yoetz. Pele is a divine adjective. It is only ever used in the Hebrew Scriptures to describe the character or nature of God. For instance, when the angel of the Lord, the Christophany, appeared to the parents of Samuel, and I asked his name, he said, why do you ask my name? For it is Pele, Pele. The angel of the Lord, of course, being a Christophany, an Old Testament and fleshment manifestation of Jesus. Pele. Pele Yoetz, wonderful counselor. Um, Sar Shalom is Prince of Peace. Mighty God, El Yibor, El Yibor, God Almighty, God Almighty. Aviad, <coughs> Aviad, the eternally enduring Father, Avi, Avi, Abba, the eternally enduring Father. Now notice. In Isaiah 9, 6, we have a veiled but st substantive theology of the triunity of the Godhead, if you will, the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is our wonderful counselor, Pelioetz. But the Spirit of Jesus was, was the Holy Spirit. Aviad, the eternal Father, or everlasting Father, the Father without end. Jesus, show us the Father. Have you not seen me? There's three, three persons, one God, but the Spirit of God and the Father, God the Father, were manifested in this child that is born, the Son that was given, or that would be given. What's God like? Well, look at Jesus. What's the Father like? Well, look at Jesus. He's the exact replica, reflection, not even replica, reflection, mirror image. Uh, what's the Holy Spirit like? Look at Jesus. That was his spirit. So you see the triunity of the Godhead in this prophecy, but we see something else. The government will be upon his shoulder. That is not true. The government is in the hands of fallen men. The world is ruled by corrupt politicians and dictators. Many of these people are demon-possessed. And the closer we get to the return of Jesus, the more demonic possession we're going to see. That is why in the last hundred years we've seen people like, obviously, Hitler and Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot, Idi Amin, these people were demon-possessed. Uh, Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sun in North Korea, they're demon-possessed. You're seeing more and more despotic, anti-God political figures emerging. But now you're seeing that happen in the Western Protestant democracies. More and more. And you're seeing the Pope playing into the hands of these people. Um, it's getting worse and worse and worse. No, the government is not on his shoulder. He's, he's reigning in heaven. He's ruling in the hearts of his people. But he is not in control of this world. He said it is Satan's kingdom. 
Jesus said, the Son of Man comes that the works of Satan will be destroyed. In his first coming, he comes to atone for sin and to bring second birth. In his return, he comes to establish his kingdom. The government will be upon his shoulder. No more politicians. No more dictators. No more corrupt bureaucrats. He is going to rule it personally from the throne of David. So Isaiah's prophecy about the birth of Jesus in chapter 9, it is both about his first coming and about his second, something the Jews could not understand. When we study the nativity, we have to understand that they did not understand or grasp the concept of one Messiah, two comings. They didn't grasp that. We studied the Maccabees last week. What they thought was the Messiah was going to come and depose the Romans from the Temple Mount, from the Fortress Antonio, the way that the Maccabees deposed the Seleucid Greeks. That's what they expected. That was the Messianic expectation. The apostles didn't get it at first. Right up until the day of the ascension, they're asking that at this time you're going to restore the kingdom. Um, when are you going to do it? Uh, it's not for you to know the times. He, he implicitly conveyed he would, but it didn't happen yet. Last thing he said, no, it didn't happen yet. It still has to happen. Uh, there's more to come. But they just didn't get it. John the Baptist, the harbinger, filled with the spirit from his mother's womb, didn't get it. He asked Jesus, or sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one, or should we look for another? Now, this was the one who was filled with the spirit from his mother's womb. He recognized Jesus embryonically. <laughs> He baptized Jesus in the Jordan. When the Holy Spirit came down, he heard the voice of the Father speak from heaven. I, it's incredible. And then he has doubts, not about Jesus, but about his Messiahship. They just couldn't understand that it's one Messiah, two comings. We have separate teachings on this. Hamashiach ben Yosef and Hamashiach Ben David, I only mention that in passing, but let's look. They just didn't get it. They looked and they read the sons of Isaiah and they knew certain things about the Messiah, but they couldn't understand how he could not be a political figure. Hence, these prophecies in Isaiah are not just about his first coming, they're about his second. I've spoken many times about the way the early Christians handled the scripture as Jews. They used Pesher interpretations. A Peshet, from the Hebrew word Peshut, as most of you know, is the plain, straightforward meaning. meaning. The Pesher is the future prophetic fulfillment of it. We see this very much in the Nativity. Let's look at Hosea 11.1. 1. Out of Egypt I called my son. When Israel was a youth, I loved him. Hosea was commemorating the exodus under Moses. Israel comes out of Egypt. But Matthew says, the Pesha interpretation of this is Jesus returning from Egypt after Herod is dead. Now, again, we have other teachings explaining Pesha interpretation. But the nativity, a proper understanding of the nativity, depends on it. Not only for the first coming, but for the second. There are many passages in the Old Testament that need to be understood for the nativity narratives to make good sense. One of which, of course, is the book of Ruth, the beginning of the house of David and the ancestry of Jesus. Uh, 
Matthew 1 1 begins with the genealogy of Jesus. Matthew 0 are the last six verses in the book of Ruth. The genealogy of the Messiah does not begin in Matthew, it begins in Ruth. It just is a continuation. So, too, the last thing it says in the New Testament, the last thing is a prediction of Elijah coming before the first coming of Christ. He's going to restore families and things like that. But behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu Hanavi, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Christian marriages and families are under attack as never before. Jesus warned of children turning against parents, parents against children for his namesake. But God will in some way address this problem through the coming ministry of Elijah. It also has applications for the church and spiritual sonship, but we won't go into that now. Now, Elijah comes before the great and terrible day of the Lord. But when we read Matthew 16, 17, 18, Jesus said Elijah has come. But he said something else in Matthew. Elijah is coming, but he has come. The prophecies from the Old Testament had the peshit fulfillment, the simple fulfillment in John the Baptist. There's a deeper fulfillment when the ministry of Elijah returns before the return of Christ. Why am I pointing out all of these Old Testament passages? Because they show that the nativity is not only about his first coming. It teaches about his second coming. In fact, it teaches at least as much and in some ways more, but at least as much and in certain ways more about his second coming than it does the first. We must understand the peshit, the simple meaning, tell the little kids the so-called nativity story in Sunday school. Make sure they get the, the Pesha, what's simple. But we have to move on to the Pesha, what it's really saying about his return. Let's continue. Well, turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Luke. Chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabitants of the earth. This was the first census. There were actually two. Taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. We have a dating problem or a dating complication looking at Luke's gospel relative to Matthew and to certain historical sources over that. It's only explained by the fact that Luke differentiates between the first census and the second. It is likely that Jesus was born two, three, four, what we would call BC, Anno Domine, uh, before the AD. Well, we don't know the year or the day of his first coming because people are not going to know the year or the day of his second coming either. <laughs> Yet there was a messianic expectation growing. There was a messianic fervor after the Hasmoneans began to deteriorate and they made a deal with the Romans and now the Romans were invited in. Well, when the Romans came in, the general Pompey entered the Holy of Holies in the temple. By invitation, he came in. The Jews made a peace treaty 
with the pagans. They looked to Rome for protection. And Pompey entered the Holy of Holies. When anyone other than the high priest on the Day of Atonement enters the Holy of Holies, essentially, it is a picture of the Antichrist. Christ enters the Holy of Holies when he takes our sin in Hebrews, and he's prefigured by David eating the showbread. But these other people who entered it, who were not the high priest on the Day of Atonement, they're types of the Antichrist. I point you to our book, Shadows of the Beast. Pompey does that. The Jews make this deal with Europe and get more than they bargained for. Now they're longing for somebody to get rid of the Romans the way the Maccabees got rid of the Greeks. There was a political desperation that had a religious ramification. That is going to happen again. Now, look what Caesar Augustus did. He had been the general Octavius who defeated Mark Antony at the Battle of Actium. Other emperors like Julius Caesar were deified by the Roman Senate posthumously. After they were dead, the Roman government declared them to be gods. Caesar Augustus, however, was different. He was legally and officially deified, pronounced by Roman law to be a god during his lifetime. Much the same as the Egyptians worshipped Pharaoh as a divine being. This is what is going to happen again. What does Caesar Augustus do? He tries to assign everybody a number in the world in order to maintain financial and economic control of the known world, which was essentially the Roman Empire. There were certain places outside of it, but the world then was mainly the Roman Empire, and he controlled it. He, on the hand, didn't do that, but he assigned them a number. So you have somebody who bamboozles the Jews, who makes a treaty, who, defi who they defile the temple, and as the Antichrist will do with the abomination, and who assigns everybody a number in order to financially control the economy. That is going to happen again. What happened in his first coming happens in his second. Let's go further. Let's look at the wise men in Matthew. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of Matthew. Verse 7. Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time that the star appeared and sent them to Bethlehem. Well, there are different theories as to what this star is. But there's a prophecy in Numbers, the star will come from the east. Later on, an antichrist proclaimed to be the Messiah by Rabbi Akiva in the second century at the second Jewish revolt. They took that prophecy of the star from Numbers and applied it to Bar Kokhva, which means in Aramaic, son of the star. Again, a major picture of the Antichrist. But this was a sign. We saw his sign appear. What do we see in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, for instance? Then they will see the sign of the coming of the Son of Man in the heavens, in the sky, in the Uranus in Greek. That's going to happen again. The wise men knew the sign. The others knew something was happening, but they didn't understand it until it was too late. There was a sign in the sky. 
The book of Joel speaks of this. The book of Revelation speaks of this. There was a sign. Jesus said they will see the sign of his coming. There was a sign of his first coming. There was a celestial sign of his second coming. Right now, this year, something is happening that has not happened since the early 1200s, since the 1300, uh, 13th century. Um, it's, it's the closest time since the beginning of the Renaissance that Saturn and Jupiter have come to each other in their solar orbits. And it creates an effect. Uh, some people speculate it could have been something of that nature. Most people don't know. It's interesting to read what Josephus said of a comet hanging over Jerusalem in the shape of a sword in 70 AD. Be that as it may, there are all kinds of theories. What we know are two things. There was a celestial sign of his coming the first time, and only the wise men understood it. There will be a celestial sign of his second coming, and only the wise will understand it. Remember Daniel chapter 11 and 12, what we talked about when we studied the Maccabees and Hanukkah last week. None of the wicked will understand. Non-believers won't get this. So-called Christians in the apostate church won't get this. Let he who has wisdom count the number of the beast. Now understand the desperation of Satan, what he's doing now. When he gets a hold of a figure like John MacArthur, a man who is usually right about most things, but it was that kind of credibility, saying that it will be possible to take the mark of the beast and still be saved in direct contradiction to Revelation chapter 14, chapter 16, and chapter 20, in direct contradiction. You've got a problem. Not just what he's saying is false, it's the person who's saying it has credibility among sincere believers. This is very dangerous. This is to say nothing of the more obvious deceivers who say avoid end time prophecy, it's a diversion. Rick Warren says keep away from it. We've talked about this many times. Right now we're being attacked by Chris Rosebro. Now Chris Rosebro, maybe he's crazy. He's a catechetical Lutheran. In other words, he believes a combination of Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. He's a sacramentalist. He literally stands in front of a statue of Jesus with no stigmata and prays to it, dressed like a, 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 in Babylonian vestments, and he stands in front of the statue and prays. Um, he promotes the vision of Doreen Virtue, not the vision. She said Jesus literally physically appeared to her, but he had no stigmata, no nail marks. She had his picture described to an artist who painted it, and there was no, again, Chris Roseboro's Jesus' his statue has no, and this is, he stands in front of it and prays. It's false Christ. It's a false Christ. Uh, whenever Jesus appears, it was always from heaven, not on earth. And the nail marks are always there. Zechariah 12, they'll look upon me who they have pierced. Revelation 1, 7, they will look upon him who they have pierced. Even in eternity, the pierce marks are there. There's a beautiful gospel song, American country gospel song by Gillian Welsh, by the marks where the nails have been. I'll know my Savior when I come to him. A beautiful gospel song. Uh, he, he's got those marks eternally. This guy's got a different Christ. And Rosebro teaches his people all kinds of crazy stuff. He says, uh, sin is forgiven by confessing your sin to him. He has the power to forgive your sin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Again, he's a catechetical Lutheran, mixing Catholicism with Protestantism, but he's a cult within that uh, that even other, other Lutherans and other Lutheran ministers recognize. But this is his teaching. There's no Antichrist. 
There's no 666. The book of Revelation is purely symbolic. And simultaneously, the Great Tribulation has been going on since the day of Pentecost. And the millennial reign of Christ has been going on since the day of Pentecost. They both have been going on concurrently, simultaneously, since the first century. Don't worry about Revelation. It's symbolic. There's no Antichrist, no 666. Satan has anointed this man to deceive people, and he comes in the name of a discernment ministry. Rick Warren, he comes to deceive people. I say it with trepidation. John MacArthur is doing it. We're getting closer and closer to the return of Jesus. And Satan is getting more and more desperate. Remember, there's three kinds of people in God's economy. Jews, Gentile nations, and believers who could be either Jew or Gentile. Satan has Israel deceived. Most Jews reject their own Messiah or don't believe anything. And the ones who do believe in God are caught up in Talmudic rabbinism. The nations, Satan's deceived the nations. Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Shintoism, shamanism, deceived the nations. He's trying to deceive the third entity, believers. He's trying to deceive Christians, Jew and Gentile. And as we can see, he's doing it. But he's doing it through people who have credibility, not just crazy ones. Very problematic. Very problematic. Now, a lot more can be said about this with the conspiracy theorists and the date setters. You know, there's one crazy guy, Robert Breaker, who said that Revelation 12 was fulfilled September 17th. I'm sorry, September 23rd, 2017. And people believed him. People said they were saved Christians believed him. How crazy can it get? This deception aimed at the elect is going to happen more and more as the return of Christ gets closer. Remember, there were many false messiahs when he came the first time. Rabbi uh, 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 Gamaliel spoke of this in Acts chapter 5. Remember, he said, Judas of Galilee. And the, there were many false messiahs. Barabbas, Barabbas, a political figure. There were many false messiahs when he came the first time. There's going to be false messiahs when he comes again. In fact, when you read Isaiah chapter 8, before you get to chapter 9, a child is given, you see that two things increase before he comes. One is conspiracy theories. Before Isaiah warns us in chapter, tells us in chapter 9, a child is born, a son is given. He warns, and there's no chapter division in the Hebrew canon, as you know, you are not to call a conspiracy all these people call a conspiracy. There's going to be conspiracy theories abundantly before the Lord comes, same as there was in his first coming. And second, he talks about the wizards and the makshafut, the practices of the occult. He wasn't warning about pagan practices. He was warning about the occult practices that came into Israel. Israel was warned by Isaiah, or God warned through Isaiah, my people are seduced by the influences of the East. In the, in the book of Isaiah. Well, now, now the church is seduced by influences of the East. So much of what these people teach is basically New Age masquerading as Christianity with roots in Hinduistic thought and Eastern shamanism. That's Young E. Chow, that's Mike Bickle, that's Bill Johnson. That's what these things are. Kundalini Yoga was the Toronto one in Canada. This what... This is what happened to Israel before his first coming. This is what happens to the church when he comes again. Before the nativity, we see all these things happening. Well, what else do we see? Let's look at Revelation chapter 12. A 
a sign appeared in heaven. You always got that sign. There's always the sign in heaven before the Messiah comes. Revelation 12 is a Pesher interpretation of the nativity narrative of the Peshit. It recycles the nativity to explain what's going to happen with his second coming. A great sign appears in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun had the moon under her feet. This, of course, relates to the vision of Joseph in the book of Genesis. And on her head, a crown of 12 stars. She was with child and cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. We've explained this many times. Seismology and obstetrics are the two main illustrations God uses to explain what it's going to be like before Jesus comes. Birth pangs and uh, tremors. Before the big earthquake, you get the shifts in the tectonic plates. Before a baby is actually born, you have maternal contractions. Interim periods of respite, but then they come back with a greater ferocity until the baby is born or until the earthquake finally happens. Then another sign appeared in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. Again, this comes from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, and the book of Daniel, chapter 8. I only mention it in passing. He's trying to kill the baby coming out of the woman when this sign appears in the heavens. But we're told the baby is caught away and protected for 2,000 Oh, I'm sorry, 1,260 days, three and a half years by the lunar calendar. So he's trying to kill this kid, gets duped, gets outmaneuvered, fails. What does he do? Oi, va voi, va voi. Verse 17. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Well, let's look at it. What did Herod do when Jesus was rescued? He killed the other babies, didn't he? He killed the other children. Once the faithful church, the body of Christ, is rescued, something's going to happen. Now notice the church has to go through three and a half years or something. I'm not saying that the rapture is at the midpoint, but I am saying that the last seven years of Daniel are divided into two halves. The rapture cannot possibly happen in the first three and a half years, let alone before the seven. That is another deception Satan is perpetrating against sincere Christians, the pre-tribulational myth that's only really been around since the 19th century. Don't believe it. Separate subject. We have plenty of teaching addressing it. But let's look at this now. So... The dragon wants to kill the baby coming out of the woman when the stars, a sign appears in the heaven. The baby's protected. Uh, and then when he finds out what happened, he goes and he kills the other kids. What did Herod, this is Christmas. This is the nativity. Herod wanted to remain the king of the Jews. He wanted to kill Jesus. He killed his own sons. He was a paran delusional paranoiac. So keen to keep power, he killed some of his own sons for fear they'd make a move on the throne. He had no problem killing babies. <laughs> well, today, people have no problem killing babies. Unless God intervenes, you're going to have two baby killers in the White House. You're going to have two people who favor late-term 
abortion, partial birth abortion. Two murderers. Lives of babies don't matter in his first coming. Lives of babies won't matter to the political power in his second coming. People aren't getting this. You even got some Christians who are so blind and arrogant and deluded that they said, well, even though, and I'm not being political here, Mr. Trump is pro-life. <clears throat> He's still a bad person. And even though Biden and Harris are pro-abortion and pro-late late term abortion and pro-partial birth abortion, we should still vote for them because they're not like Mr. Trump. He's the bad man. This is how they think. you got ridiculous, pathetic figures, failed leaders, spiritually and theologically failed leaders like John Piper, merchandising this kind of deception. Now, when people like Piper and MacArthur, let alone Rick Warren, I mean, that should be obvious, Chris Roseborough, Agents of Satan dispatched to make the elect misled, deceived, not ready to understand what's happening and what to do about it. This is the reality. It's dark and getting darker. Then they'll tell you, of course, I'm crazy. I'm, I'm a cult leader. I'm a this, I'm a that. <laughs> Okay, of course they're going to say things like that. Par for the course. People like that have always said things like that. Now, let's look further. Herod wants to kill the baby coming out of the woman to keep power. The baby's protected, and he goes and whacks the rest of the kids in Bethlehem. This is a prophecy in Revelation 12. It's a coming event, the nativity happens again. The numbering of the people, deified leader of Europe, Israel making a treaty, the temple being defiled, it happens again. Again, I have to point you to the book Shadows of the Beast. Herod the Great, of course, built the retaining wall around the Temple Mount and filled it in. The Wailing Wall is the western retaining wall of the Herodian expansion. And he expands the second temple using the influences of Greco-Roman architecture. And his blueprint is the millennial temple in Ezekiel. Herod tries to counterfeit the millennium. That's what the Antichrist is going to do. Not only that, but overshadowing the temple on the um, north side, northeast quadrant of the Temple Mount, there's the Fortress Antonio, a pagan Roman military fortress with Roman phoenixes and eagles and pagan ensigns, overtowering, overshadowing the house of God. This was an affront to the people. On Palm Sunday, they wanted Jesus to come to the East Gate and make a right and get rid of the Fortress Antonio. As you've heard me say, instead of doing that, he made a left and got rid of Kenny, Benny, and Joyce. Judgment begins in the house of God. In his second coming, he'll depose the powers of the world. The government will be on his shoulders. So, unless you understand the history of Herod and of Caesar Augustus, you can't understand the Antichrist and what he's going to do. You can't. Unless you understand the Nativity and how the prophecies in the Old Testament about the Nativity point to his second coming, not just his first. You're never going to understand the book of Revelation. It's a waste of time to even try. It takes wisdom. It takes wisdom. And you got Satan, Satan, speaking through the mouth of people like Rick Warren, avoid studying these subjects as a diversion. Yeah, but Jesus 
reiterated, be alert, be alert. Oh, forget about what Jesus said. Listen to Rick Warren. Who needs the New Testament if you have the purpose-driven lie? Satan speaking through the mouth of Chris Rosebro. Unbelievable. Oh, it's all some, there's no antichrist, there's no mark of the beast, it's only symbolic. The millennium's already happening, and the, the great tribulation's always been going on. It's no. What are you going to do with this? Oh, it's okay to take the mark of the beast. Some people saying that now. Or even a sanitized version of it, that the people who do take it are still going to be able to be saved, the MacArthurism. And he's defended by Phil Johnson and these guys. They're so desperate to defend this lie that Phil Johnson, the ghostwriter, the right-hand man of, of John MacArthur, bought in Doreen Virtue, this woman <laughs> who, who was a New Age authoress who claims to have seen this vision of Jesus. Not a vision, sorry, an apparition, a physical apparition of Jesus who was not crucified. And MacArthur's church brings her in to defend MacArthur on the number of the beast. They go to a crazy woman, somebody who's been a witch and may still be, to defend MacArthur. You go to a wicked, a crazy, deranged woman who claims that Jesus Christ appeared to her. That's who you're getting to defend John MacArthur? that you can take the mark of the beast. This is serious deception, friends. I'm not being an alarmist. <laughs> I'm just being a realist. We must be a lot closer to the return of Jesus than most of us have really appreciated until now. Again, I don't speculate about dates, and I don't know, but <laughs> we certainly know by the signs the signs. In his first coming, there were people who knew and people who didn't. You had Israel. You had Jerusalem. They expected the Messiah to come to Jerusalem. At this time of year, they believed that Hanukkah, he would reveal himself as the Messiah. And notice the angel Gabriel and Daniel explains things to Daniel and he shows up again centuries later, 500 years later, and explains things to Mary <laughs> and Joseph. Gabriel, the mighty one of God. I have no doubt we're going to see satanic counterfeits of angelic ministry in the last days. We've always seen it, but it's going to intensify. But we're also going to see authentic angelic ministry before Jesus returns. But only the faithful will know which is which. <clears throat> well, let's look at this now. Let's look at this. They had all the signs. They had all the prophecies. It was their hope, what the New Testament calls the blessed hope, the return of Jesus, the second coming of Christ. The pre-trib people redefine it as the rapture. No, it includes the rapture, but it's not the rapture. It's the return of Christ. That's the blessed hope. We all have the blessed hope. People who were not raptured had the blessed hope because they're going to be resurrected. So for our blessed hope, to them it was the messianic hope. They had the hope of his coming. They had the scriptures predicting his coming. They had the territory, the place, their whole identity and heritage as a nation and a people was predicated upon the messianic redemption. Oh, boy you would think they would be ready. When the signs happened, when the predictions given by the prophets were conspicuously manifesting, 
in history, when God was really speaking, you'd think they'd be ready. This nation, waiting for the Messiah, coming to Jerusalem for the pilgrim feast with messianic expectation, celebrating Hanukkah this time of year with messianic expectation. Boom, boom, boom. Well, most of them didn't understand his first coming and weren't ready. And I'm sorry to say, the reality is most Christians don't understand his second coming and won't be ready. Some will. Some Hebrews were ready for the first coming. Some believers, Christians, Jew and non-Jew, will be ready for his second. Remember, and Daniel, none of the wicked are going to understand. Only the wise are going to get this. What kind of believers, I ask this time of year, can you tell me, can you tell the church, can you, with conviction, declare what kind of believers are going to be ready for his second coming? Well, yes, I can. It's all in the nativity. The kinds of Christians who are going to be ready for his second coming are the kinds of Jews ready for his first coming. But in his first coming, there were Jews and Gentiles. The wise men knew better than the Jews. So too in his return. The wise men were from Persia. They were probably Median descent. The Medes were the ancestors of the modern Kurds. And they were the they were in confederation with the Persians. Darius the Mede um, was the king of the Persian Empire, but he was an ethnic Mede, much the same as Cyrus was an ethnic Persian. It was like England and Scotland. They had a confederation, a union. Well, there's a lot more you, you can say about the, the Magi. Chuck Missler did some good research on the Magi, actually, at one time, and so had several academics. Don't want to go into it now, but it's interesting. These were Gentiles. Now, the Zoroastrian religion today is not the Zoroastrian religion of Zarathustra. He was a monotheist who was influenced by the Jews. He believed things similar to the Essenes and similar to the early Christians, a battle between the sons of darkness and the sons of light. He was a monotheist who said there's one God, and he said that people are morally responsible for their own sin. We can say that Zarathustra had the most light a non-Jew could have had. Didn't have the scriptures, although there was obviously influences of the Jews during the Babylonian captivity. It's sort of like Plato. Plato described man as a group of people chained in a dark, dingy cave. One man escapes and goes outside and sees the light. And he sees butterflies and birds and a brook and fauna and flowers and animals. And he runs back into the cave and tells people, you're in darkness, we're in darkness. There's a whole new creation out there. I saw the light and the people thought he was crazy. Well, remember, we're imagio dei beings. We're made in the image and likeness of God. Guatama, not to be confused with the plump statue of Buddha, the real Guatama knew that Hinduism was superstitious and unjust because of the caste system. He knew it. Um, Guatama, the real Buddha, and Buddhism was invented about 300 years after him, at least the writings of Buddhism, uh, he saw through the falseness of Hinduism. So too <clears throat> Confucius 
was a moral philosopher. He didn't claim to be a god or a theologian. Well, Plato and Socrates was a monotheist. We're told in Romans, even people who don't have the word of God can know certain basic things, that there is one true God and that there's a moral law. Even non-believers can know that because they're made in God's image and likeness. Again, I only mention this very briefly and passing it as a different subject, but this was the background of the Magi in part. Today, these Zoroastrians, they're, they're crazy. They, they're fire venerators and all sorts of other things. And they have a particular way of disposing of corpses. It's not a burial. It's not a cremation. <clears throat> it is not a uh, composting, because they're composting corpses now and natural burials and things like this. It's none of that. They <laughs> actually hack the, the dismember the corpse, put it on a ledge, and wait for vultures to come and take it to heaven, <laughs> piece by piece. And, uh, this, this is their religion. But it was not always like that. It was not always like that. It had a certain amount of light. And these wise men, as <coughs> we call them, the Magi, knew from the signs, even though they weren't Jews. Even though they weren't Jews. The Jews were in Israel. And they were consumed with politics, economics, and religiosity. They weren't looking to the scriptures in the way they should. The oral law had already emerged, even though it wasn't written. The traditions of the elders and things like that. The uh, What would later become the Mishnah and things like that. Be that as it may, that was the state. When Jesus comes again, the people who are going to know the signs most and best will be from the Gentile nations. There are far more believers among the nations than there are from Israel. Far more. We will not, again, complete evangelizing Israel till the Messiah comes. But then we have the Jews who were ready. As I've said many times, if you want to know what kind of Christians, the remnant, the wise, the whatever you want to call them, if you want to know what kind of Christians are going to be ready for his second coming, all we have to do is look at what kind of Jews were ready for his first. Let's begin. But let's begin looking at what kind were not ready. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 2. Verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews. For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard it, this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him, gathering together the chief priests and scribes of the people. He inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born, and they said in Bethlehem, Judea, for this is what has been written to us and they quote verbatim, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And to you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, also known as Ephrata, are by no means among the least of the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people. Now, when we read Micah, It's quite interesting. We're told something else in the book of Micah. We are told that the going forth in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, the going forth of this one too little to be among the clans of Judah for you will go forth for me 
to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. The Messiah would be pre-existent. He's God. How could he not be? So they should have known from their scriptures that the Messiah was a pre-existent being. Going to be born in Bethlehem. Notice they had the right theology in their head. They knew the scriptures. Jesus said this to the Pharisees, to the Sanhedrin. He searched the scriptures, and they do speak of me. He told them that. He told them that. They had the head knowledge. The head knowledge is indispensable. Nobody questions that. But it's a long distance from here to here. Knowledge puffs up. Now, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Knowledge is indispensable. It's essential. But if it's only here and it's not here, it doesn't do us any good. You go to Bible belts, Northern Ireland, the American South, Korea, areas of East Africa. Bible belts. For cultural reasons, everybody has heard the gospel. You ask the average person in East Belfast, why did Jesus die and things like that? They can tell you. You ask somebody in Tennessee or Georgia, no, I can tell you. There's a church in Seoul, Korea, on every other block with a huge steeple and a massive choir. They can all tell you. They can tell you. <laughs> Go to Kenya, you say in Swahili, Bwana Sifiwe. They'll say Bwana Sifiwe. Praise the Lord. They all know the, the jargon. <laughs> but how many are truly born again and saved in the Bible Belt or something else? Oh, they all have it here. You can have it here. There are professors of divinity at Yale Divinity School and at Oxford and Cambridge. They have it here. They're experts in reading the scriptures in the original language. They know the historical background backwards and forwards. They're highly educated, very intelligent people. But they're not saved. How can you have all that knowledge in your head and know this and not be saved? <laughs> well, that's the way it was when Jesus came the first time. That's the way it is when he comes again. Nobody's putting down the knowledge. But if somebody has a right heart, they will get the knowledge. If somebody has a right heart, God will give them the knowledge. They will apply themselves to understanding the Scripture and understanding God on the basis of his revealed word. If somebody has a right heart, God will make sure they have a right head. But it doesn't always work so easily the other way. Nay, thank God for theologians who are saved and linguists, linguistic scholars who are saved. Thank God for that. Jesus said, I'll send you scribes and so forth. Thank God for the educated people who really are saved. Thank God that he gave us people like William Tyndale and uh, John Wycliffe and people like this. We wouldn't have the scriptures in our language. Thank God for them. But uh, <laughs> the Levitical priests in Herod's court were not ready for the Messiah to come. They knew the scripture. Well, let's look at Herod. I've mentioned this various times, and I again point you to the book, Shadows of the Beast. Herod the Great was not a great guy. He was a great builder. But his parents were Idumean. Okay, we spoke about this last week, I think. They were Edomites, Arabs, descendants of Esau, 
and so forth, who came from Jordan in the Hasmonean period when the Hasmoneans, that is after the Maccabees, conquered the center and north of Jordan. They conquered Amman, part of Moab, and southern Jordan, Edom. Edom, Edomites, Edom, Idumea. They bought a chunk of the population of these Arabs who converted to Judaism into the northern Negev. This became Idumea. South of Jerusalem. You can go there now and see the Herodium. It's amazing. I've always looked at it, but I never went in it. But now you can go into it. It's where Herod is buried. And it looks like a volcano. He hollowed out the inside of a mountain without blasting, without steam shovels, <laughs> without bulldozers. What a builder he was for the ancient world. Unbelievable. He was an Idumean. That was the area in the northern Negev. That's why he put Masada in the Negev. Well, so you have somebody who's an ethnic Arab, but by religion a Jew. But when you read the way the New Testament describes the Herodians and the way the Romans treated them, although they were genetically, anthropologically Arab, they were by religion Jews. But by nationality, civil identity, political allegiance, Romans. To the Europeans, to the Romans, they were Roman. To the Arabs, they were Arab. To the Jews, they were Jews. And this begins with Herod the Great. The Antichrist will likely be the same. He will be able to be as all things to all people. He'll be able to make an artificial peace between Jew and Arab because the Arabs are going to think in part he's one of our guys. The Jews are going to think he's our guy. And the Romans or the Europeans are going to think he's our guy. He's going to know how to be all things to all people. He's going to counterfeit Christ. And he's going to try to establish the millennium the way Herod the Great did when he used Ezekiel's blueprint of the millennial temple to expand the temple. He made himself the messianic figure. He's the king of the Jews. No, oh, Jesus is the king of the Jews, Yeshua. <laughs> Herod is a major type of the Antichrist. Now again, we have a lot of teaching is devoted to explaining this and addressing it, particularly in the book Shadows of the Beast. But notice something. When Jesus comes, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. The clergy, the political class, the leaders were troubled when Jesus came. They didn't want him to come. They wanted to keep power and wealth for themselves. They weren't looking to the redemption, the salvation. They deified themselves. They had a political game and a self-serving game. They were not ready. When Jesus comes back, the mainstream leadership of Christianity, let's call it Christendom, will be incorporated into and foundational to the apostate church. They're not going to be ready. The political establishment will be in league with it. This relates to what we see in Revelation 17 and 18. The financial establishment will be in league with it. The powers that rule this world who are animated by Satan, the god of this world, will not want Jesus to come. But that includes the mainstream religious leadership. Forget about godly leaders. 
they're going to wind up with the Antichrist. But let's go further. Let's look at what kind of Jews were ready for Jesus to come. Once we know that, once we got that down, we're going to know what kind of Christians are going to be ready for Jesus to come. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Luke. Chapter 1, verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Aviah. My father is Yahweh. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. She was a Levite. And her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. In Scripture, whenever you see a supernatural conception, usually they were geriatric pregnancies, going back to Sarah and the parents of, of, of Samuel and things like that. When you see a supernatural conception, uh, again, they're usually with a geriatric pregnancies. It foreshadows that the Messiah would be conceived supernaturally. Okay? They show that it took an act of divine intervention to have the pregnancy. Well, Isaiah 7.14, a virgin shall conceive. This shall be the sign, a virgin shall conceive. Now, the word there in Hebrew is Alma, Alma. You have two possible words for virgin in Hebrew. Alma and Betula, Betula. Because the word in Isaiah 7 is Alma, which can mean a young maiden, the rabbis will tell Jewish young people who are asking questions about Jesus that they don't like, no, this is nonsense. It doesn't say be born of a virgin. It just says it'll be born of a young woman. Well, first of all, how can that be a sign? Young women get pregnant every day of the week. How can it be a sign? What the rabbis don't tell the people is, in the Septuagint, the ancient rabbis, seven times translated Alma Parthenos, virgin. Seven times they translated it virgin. Only one time did they translate it a maiden. And under Jewish law, a, maid, a maiden was anyway, by definition, a virgin. <laughs> it's unbelievable what the rabbis do with Scripture. It's unbelievable what the Jehovah's Witnesses do with Scripture. It's unbelievable what the Mormons do with Scripture. It's unbelievable what the Roman Catholic Church does with Scripture. It is unbelievable. But they do it, and people believe it, unfortunately. So, we press on. You had a corrupted Levitical clergy. How corrupt? At one time, the line of Zadok, Tzadik, Tzadok, the priest, the Zadokites, were the only Levitical priests who were not corrupt. And Ezekiel promised that the high priesthood would go through the line of Zadok, the Zadokites. It's where you get the word righteous, Charity, staka, and a righteous person, a tzaddik, the line of tzaddik. As I've explained before, the Sadducees were their descendants. Tzadukim, Sadducim. They began right, but they became very corrupted. What did the Sadducees believe, or perhaps better put, what did they not believe? Long before modern liberal higher criticism and 19th century German rationalism, 
pretending to be Christianity with people like Councilman and Rudolf Bultmann and so forth and Mo Winkle and these people. Uh, the Sadducees were anti-supernaturalist, anti-supernaturalist rationalists. They denied the miracles of the Torah. They denied these miraculous events. They also denied the resurrection and afterlife. They denied it. It was about this life. This was the clergy. They didn't believe. The clergy was corrupted. The Sadducees controlled the high priesthood. And like the Herodians, they were often in bed with the Romans to advance their own interests. The Pharisees not, usually. At least not the Pharisees who lived in Israel. Some of the Pharisees, like Paul, who were from outside of Israel, the diasporic Pharisees, well, they may have been Roman citizens and things. But generally, the Pharisees did not like Roman rule. The Sadducees would make a deal with anybody. The clergy was corrupt. People would buy the high priestly position for money. And they'd bribe the Romans to support it and things as all kinds of things. The political end game. Yet corrupt as the clergy was. As corrupt as it was. There were certain righteous individuals within it. That's the way it was when he came the first time. That's the way it's going to be when he comes again. The assemblies of God is no longer the assemblies of the true God. The Pensacola deception took care of that. Calvary Chapel is no longer the Calvary Chapel's of Chuck Smith. Brian Broderson and those guys took care of that. The Southern Baptists are no longer the traditional Southern Baptists. J.D. Greer, who said the church should be the number one spokesman for homosexual and lesbian rights, he took care of that. The Anglicans, the Church of England, <laughs> <laughs> it's a complete joke. It's a total joke. The Church of Scotland, the Presbyterian, the Scotland, the total joke. They're all jokes. Lutheranism is a joke. Methodism is not the Methodism of John Wesley. It is a joke. Lord Soper. He's an atheist who was a Methodist clergyman. At least he was an agnostic, if not an atheist. It's just a joke. All these denominations have gone down the sewer. All of them. And people in them who know better are compromising with it. Even the people who claim to be the voices of discernment. And right doctrine are now teaching major error. Desperate. But here and there, now and then, you'll find a pastor, a pastor and his wife, a godly couple who love Jesus, who preach the true gospel, who expound the scriptures in an exegetically responsible manner under the anointing of the Spirit who feed and try to protect the flock. Many of them have little churches. Some have larger ones, but not much. Faithful clergy. The system's corrupt. The system is gone. When Jesus came the first time, the Levitical priesthood, the Zadokites, it was corrupt. It was gone. John the Baptist was the son of a high priest, and he said, I'm getting out of here. I'm going out to the wilderness. I'm not staying in Jerusalem. He is God. 
Remember, all Jerusalem went out to hear John preach when Jesus came the first time. They weren't getting fed in Jerusalem by the Levites. They had to go out to the wilderness. Like I taught other teachings, men like not like other men. That's going to happen again. People are not going to be fed in the mainstream churches and denominations. They're going to have to go out to the wilderness to hear the truth. Maybe the cyber wilderness, but that's where they're going to have to go to hear the truth. You're not going to hear the truth in a church. You hear a lie in a church. There'll still be somebody there to lie to you. There'll be somebody there to preach a false gospel or to mix truth with error. You, you can find all of that in a church. Deception. Spiritual seduction. No no problem finding that in a church. <laughs> but if you, if you want the truth about the return of Jesus, you better go out into the wilderness. <laughs> You're not going to find it in a church. That's the way it was when he came the first time. <laughs> That's the way it's going to be when he comes again. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. By the way, I'm not saying it's me. I'm just, I'm the, I think there'll be more than one person. Although I do think there'll be the two witnesses and Elijah and things like that. I'm, I'm not one of those guys. I'm just, what I am is trying to tell the truth, you know, about what's happening. This is it. We're out in the wilderness. Why, why? <laughs> Why is God letting COVID demolish churches as we've known them? <laughs> They're no good anymore. Take a bulldozer to them. Now, individual churches, individual pastors, individual fellowships, yes, there are. There will always be 7,000 who won't bow the knee to bow. There will always be, always be righteous clergy. There will always be righteous people like Zacharias and his dear wife. Well, those are the kinds of Jews ready for the first coming of Jesus. Those are the kinds of Christians that are going to be ready for his second, but let's continue. Quite a story. There were shepherds watching their sheep at night. Remember, Poeon, shepherd in Greek, Episcopal, pastor in Greek. It gets dark before Jesus comes, very dark. But there will be faithful pastors watching the sheep, no matter how dark it gets. They are the ones. Gloria and it shall cease Deo. Glory to God in the heavens. They translate it the highest, but it shall cease from the Vulgate in the heavens. In Latin. A shepherd will be like Jesus. He'll put God first and the sheep, his family second and the sheep third and himself last. He'll feed the sheep and protect the sheep, even at the expense of his own life if it comes to it. They will watch the sheep as things get darker. We will have faithful servants of God who will feed and do what they can to protect the sheep as things get darker. But they're going to know God is going to make sure they know. In that same region were some shepherds staying out in the fields, the mission field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Remember, he comes like a thief in the night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. And the glory of God shone around them. And they were terribly frightened. These things are frightening. But the people of God have no reason to be afraid. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news. Evangelion in Greek, the gospel. <laughs> 
of great joy, which will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, there's been born a savior who is Messiah the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You'll find the baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. Now, again, we all have the story, no room in the inn, the Holiday Inn Express was sold out and things like that. During the pilgrim feasts, Jews would sleep in tombs as long as there was no corpses buried in them yet. It was a common thing for people to stay in places like this when the population of Jerusalem swelled during the pilgrim feasts. So too, they had to come for the census to register in the city of your ancestry, which was the city of David. Jesus was of Davidic descent. This is a whole other thing. Someday I hope to teach the genealogies of Luke and Matthew, that Mary's genealogy is through Luke, uh, and Jesus' genealogy of Joseph is the one in Matthew. Uh, it deals with the curse of Jeconiah and things like this, why he had to be a descendant of David through his mother. It also answers the question, since the Messiah had to be from the tribe of Judah, how could John the Baptist be his cousin who had to be from the tribe of Levi, since he was a priest? Well, Mary was from Levitical descent, who married somebody from the tribe of Judah. She married trans or cross-tribally and the wife would take on the identity of the husband's tribe. But uh, Jesus was a descendant of David through Mary, but he was a legal descendant of David through Joseph. Uh, again, it's a complicated issue, and it goes back to the book of Ruth. We're not going there now, but we have to take it into account. Jesus had both Levitical and Davidic blood because the Messiah had to be both a king and a high priest. But I only say this briefly. Let's look at this now. The shepherds were ready. But then there was a teenage girl called Miriam, 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 Miriam. Not Mary. She did not have blonde hair and blue eyes. She had dark features, dark eyes, dark hair, probably olive skin. Miriam, not Mary, Miriam. And Miriam grew up in Nazareth. Lousy place to come from. But if you've been to Nazareth, on its southern exposure, it is near the Valley of Jezreel. Almost, almost, opposite of Har Megiddo, Armageddon, uh, almost opposite. You can see it on a clear day. Uh, the valley of Megiddo separates Galilee from Samaria, and Har Megiddo is on the south, but you can see Nazareth from Har Megiddo. Uh, but in between the two, on the North side, overshadowing Nazareth, is a mountain called Har Tabor, Har Tabor, Mount Tabor, which is related to the term umbilical. Interesting. It's, it's related to the term umbilical. It is where the story of Deborah took place, where Deborah and Yael killed Sisera in the days of Barak. And it's when Napoleon ascended and looked down on the valley of Armageddon and said this is the perfect place for his ultimate military campaign. This is Mount Tabor. You can go to what's called today Nazareth Elite, Upper Nazareth, on the cliff where they would have, near the cliff somewhere, where they would have thrown Jesus off. Most of the archaeologists think they know where it is. But They'll point it out to you and things. But let's go to the Song of Deborah, chapter 5 in the book of Judges.
Verse 24. Most blessed of women is Yael. It means Yahweh is God. The wife of Herber and the Kenite. Most blessed is she of women in the tent. <laughs> so what is this little Jewish girl, Miriam? I don't know if they jumped rope or played hopscotch or what they did in those days, but she was a little girl in Nazareth. Living in the shadow of Mount Tabor, you can't miss it. You can walk it. If, you, if you're a good hiker, you can walk it. I couldn't, but when I was younger, I could, and soldiers do it all the time. You could do it on foot. From where Nazareth is to Mount Tabor. Getting up the mountain might be a little more difficult, but there's people who do that, hikers and things. And she's growing up there, and this mountain is sticking out like a sore thumb. She can't miss it, but she's told as a little girl. You see that? That's where it happened, Miriam. God said that Yael is blessed among women. Blessed among women. She's looking at this thing every day as a kid growing up. Blessed among women. Blessed, oh, there it is there. Blessed among women. Little did she know that one day the angel Gabriel from the book of Daniel would show up and tell this little girl, now a teenager, who grew up in the shadow of Mount Tabor, Yael, blessed are you among women, and tell Miriam, she's just the Old Testament shadow of you. Blessed are you among women women. Isaiah 7, a Parthenos, an Alma shall conceive, and that's you. Quite a story. True story. And so we have Miriam, Jewish teenager. You know, I'm not boasting of my past sin or I'm not glorifying my own. When I was 16, I was dropping LSD all the time and experimenting with heroin before I knew the Lord, obviously. But when I was 16, I was dropping acid all the time and, 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 and experimenting with heroin and, and at the age of 16. Plus all the other pot and everything, you know. It, it was nuts. It was the hippie. I don't know. That That was me. I wasn't too godly. I didn't think too much about these things. I thought about Jesus, kind of, but not in a biblical sense. I didn't understand. But she was a different kind of teenager than a guy like me. <laughs> well, most teenagers today, or even most teenagers in the church today, whose minds and spirits are being poisoned by people like Mike Bickle and Bill Johnson and Francis Chan with lies and deception, who are being misled by Bobby Houston, teenage girls. Christian women love sex. That's what Hillsong teaches. Bobby Houston, Christian women love sex. Uh, no, 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 no. Christian women love the Lord. Christian women love their husbands. Christian women love babies. <laughs> they love their children. Sex is the vehicle. It's not the focus. The world takes the focus off loving the person and puts it on the act. The world takes the focus off the person who you're supposed to love Puts it on the act. Love my husband. I love babies. How do we get one? <laughs> you know, all this stuff. Song of Solomon, etc. The world takes the focus off the person and puts it on the means, not the ends. So does Hillsong. Christian women love sex. They got 13, 14 year old girls coming into early adolescence being poisoned with that. Mentality, the mentality of Hollywood and the world. 
the world uses sexuality to sell everything from pop music to toothpaste, the fashions, whatever. Just the business. As a young believer, I went to a church in New York that had an outreach to street people, and, and, and to, they would rescue prostitutes from pimps. And when these prostitutes got saved, you talk to them, they give you their testimony. I, I came to understand through the testimony of, I led a pimp to the Lord once, but I came to understand through the testimony of what saved pro, former prostitutes told me, that these things like sex industry and prostitution and pornography, these things, they're not about sex, they're about money. <laughs> they're not even about sex, they're about money. Well, you take the emphasis off the person and put it on the act. And then you monetize it or commercialize it. It's no different. A lot of the advertising that comes out of Covent Gardens in London and Madison Avenue in New York is just uh, pseudo, is, is, is just uh, sexually suggested, promiscuous. Pornography just takes that stuff to its natural conclusion. Well, that's the world. But when Hillsong does it, oi va voi. What they have done to teenagers in the church is disgusting. Disgusting. No wonder that Carl Lynn just got caught with the women in New York, the Hillsong pastor. Frank Houston, the father of uh, Brian Houston, the patriarch of Hillsong, Bisexual pedophile got caught. His son Brian used in, in, indicted by the basically by the royal commission who investigated it. He protected his pedophile father. This is Hills, these are the leaders of Hillsong. How are teenagers gonna be ready for the return of Christ if these are their leaders and their role models? Somebody's got the, the Bill Johnson guys and Jesus culture. This stuff is nuts. But somewhere, God found the teenage girl. And he's going to find them again. He's going to have them again. Although the church, not just society, the church has betrayed its youth. The Lord's hand is not so short it cannot save. Then she had a nice boyfriend, a nice Jewish boy named Joseph. Yosef. This again goes back to one Messiah, two comings. Hamashiach ben David and Hamashiach ben Yosef. It is fortuitous. It is was providential that Jesus' foster father name was Joseph. And we're told he's a man who was righteous and just. A young honorable guy. When he finds out Mary is pregnant outside of wedlock before their marriage was consummated, he tries to protect her dignity and put her away quietly. Oh boy. <laughs> Can you imagine what most I thought she loved me now she's marked up but I didn't do it. <laughs> he wasn't like that. He was different. Now notice he didn't consummate their relationship yet. <coughs> he <coughs> behaved in a morally responsible manner. So, when she's pregnant, he doesn't understand it as far as he could know, tries to protect her dignity. Now, he was a moral, he, he knew it couldn't be his kid because he wasn't sleeping with her yet. Well, Jewish weddings had three phases. Betrothal, which was legally binding. The engagement was legally binding. That was the contractual phase. 
Then there was the nuptial. That was the ceremonial ritual phase with the witnesses. This again relates to Matthew 19 and uh, Matthew 25 and Song of Solomon and so forth. The third phase was consummation. So you had consecration, which was engagement. You had convocation, which was the nuptial. And then you had consummation, which was the biological. For a Jewish wedding, a marriage to be valid, all three were required. You needed to have consecration, convocation, and consummation. The lie of the Roman Catholic Church that Mary was perpetually a virgin would mean that Mary and Joseph were not legitimately married by Jewish law. <laughs> How dishonoring to Mary and Joseph. Again, this is Roman Catholicism, and that was because of their Mancian influences and so forth that they got from the Greeks. Uh, everything physical was bad, and sex was physical, therefore it was bad, and this got into the church. Separate subject, but how dishonoring to Mary and Joseph to say that they were not legitimately married, and Jesus did not grow up in a, in a family, a household with legitimately married parents, which is what their doctrines would mean. So, you got this young guy, Joseph. Now, when I was a young guy, I wasn't like Joseph. If she wore a skirt, she was prey. I didn't care. All I wanted to do was sleep around. I didn't care. I didn't. Now, if somebody had done the same thing to my own sister that I was doing to somebody else's sister, I'd want to blow their brains out. What a hypocrite I was. But all I did was what I did. Like the drugs, I'm not proud of it, but I was a fornicator. I shacked up with broads, the whole bit, the world, whatever it is. And unfortunately, you name it, I did it, but thank God Jesus died to pay for what I did. I'm not proud of it, I assure you, but I'm not denying I did it. <laughs> Same as the drugs in that. Joseph, fortunately, was not like me. He was sexually honorable. I was sexually dishonorable. <coughs> Without faith in Christ, I still would be. Well, in an age of promiscuity where extramarital and premarital sex are given as socially normative and not morally indicting. A society that gives approval to it. Even churches. You know, there's churches. There was an evangelical academic in America who was passing out condoms to fight AIDS in a church from the pulpit. He was passing out condoms to unmarried young people. Unbelievable. <clears throat> One of the most sickest, depraved things I ever read in my life was the guidebook for promise keepers. That book was authored in hell. It was written by a so-called evangelical theologian named Robert Hicks, who at one time taught in Dallas Seminary. And that's what the book said. It had the imprimatur of promise keepers on it. It was their guidebook. And they published an eight-and-a-half-page defense of it when it was challenged. At one stadium in Atlanta or something, they gave out 80,000 copies of it. It was called The Masculine Journey. And it had all kinds of stuff. Jesus was a phallic male, and he was tempted to have sex with other men and all this stuff. <clears throat> but it said, when your child loses their virginity outside of marriage... See it as a rite of passage. Shake the hand and congratulate the next generation for being human. No, this is not putting a benediction on sin, but it's a different way of looking at it. Now, that was written when the AIDS, before antiretroviral medications for AIDS, herpes simplex was peaking. STDs, etc. And 
your daughter, your teenager loses their virginity, and you're supposed to shake their hand and congratulate them for being human. And this is what Promise Keepers said a Christian husband and father should be like. They also had a workbook. I couldn't believe it. In the workbook for their men's groups, they have a... The, the, <laughs> You give other men the right to question what you do sexually with your wife. I knew guys, unsaved guys, that would boast about what they did with some broad they picked up in a discotheque of a bar. Or a truck driver, about a waitress in a diner or something, a lorry driver. But there are very few unsaved people, very few unsaved people who would dishonor their wives that way and talk about what they did with their wives sexually. You have to be a promise keeper to do something that sick and perverted. And millions and millions of Christian men would join in it. And their wives were pushing them to it, thinking it was a good thing. I could say a lot more about them, but I won't. No, Joseph was not a promise keeper, thank God. That's the kind of young man that was ready for his first coming. You keep your trousers on till after you hitch, that's the end of it. You protect her dignity. That's the kind of young man going to be ready for his return. We'll be ending soon with two more of my favorite characters who are ready for his first coming. In Luke chapter 2, I love these guys. Verse 25, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. He would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, Messiah. And he came in his spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the Torah, then he took him in his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Now understand Aramaic is similar to Hebrew. Salvation, Yeshua, Jesus, an abbreviated form of Joshua, Yeshua. Yeshua, Yeshua, his name means salvation. And the difference is only in the spelling, not the, I'm sorry, the pronunciation, not the spelling. I have seen your Yeshua, your Yeshua, which you have prepared in the presence of all the peoples. A light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Oh boy. Simeon blessed them and said to Mary the mother, Behold, the child is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Just think, this was an old guy. His whole life was righteous and devout and he longed for the consolation of Israel. He wanted Jesus to come. That was the fixation of his life. Spiritually and psychologically, he was fixated on the coming of the Messiah. And God revealed to him he wasn't going to check out until the Messiah came. He picks up the baby Jesus 
and prophesies what he's going to do for the Gentile nations and for Israel, but then he gives them to his mother. And he says, he's going to be opposed and a sword is going to pierce your own heart. And when we jump ahead from the nativity narratives to the passion narratives, we see Mary was there. Mother, behold your son. His whole life was being set up for one prophecy. <laughs> it is amazing to me how God uses a whole lifetime to set somebody up for five minutes worth of ministry that has an eternal impact. <laughs> Moses, the apostle John, <laughs> certainly Simeon, the idea that I'm retired, no, no, no. You might retire from a secular job, career, or business, but you don't retire from ministry. In fact, that's when you gear up. A godly old man. Maybe they knew each other. A godly old woman, a prophetess. Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. Notice the tribes of Israel were not lost. During the reign of Asa and faithful kings, the faithful people who didn't worship Baal in the north came south to Judah and kept their tribal identities, and even the ones in the Assyrian Empire, according to Chronicles and Ezra, came back with the Jews from the Babylonian captivity. The idea that there's a 10 lost tribes is complete nonsense. It says in the epistle of uh, James to the 12 tribes, <coughs> written to Jewish believers. Well, there's all kinds of nuts. Like in the States, it's called Armstrongism. In the UK, it's called British Israelism, that the Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-Celtic people are the descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel that were lost. That's nuts. but there's people who believe it. She's a daughter of Fanuel. Advanced in years and lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then as a widow to the age of 84. That was a very old age in those times. The Lord kept her alive to a very advanced age for that time in history. Same as John the Baptist, uh, John the Apostle, to write Revelation. God kept him alive to an extremely old age. You want to live a long life? Serve the Lord. <laughs> she never left the temple, serving night and day with fasting and prayers. And at that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak to him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Her whole life was given to prayer and fasting. Her whole life. And when she saw Jesus, all she could do is tell people about the redemption. The Redeemer had come. I got something in the post today. Pardon me just for one second. We'll be finishing in a moment. I should have had it with me. from older sisters in the Lord in the north of England. They pray for our ministry and support it. They live in North Lincolnshire. And they sent me what they give out all the time. A detailed message of salvation. Jesus died for us. And they're always going out 
given out this stuff, the law of the Almighty will bring to an end that of the final satanic battle intent against Israel. They're of Jewish, they're, they were non-practicing Jews. But they got saved. And all they do is tell people about Jesus and pray for people like me. <laughs> you want to know why the Lord blesses me and uses me? It's because these old women like this who love the Lord, whose lives are dedicated to him, pray for people like me. Anna's whole life was in the temple. She remained single, didn't remarry for the sake of serving the Lord full time. <laughs> oh boy. Old lady like that. Man, that's the kind of old lady who was ready for the first coming of Jesus. That's the kind of old lady going to be ready for his return. Simeon was the kind of old man who was ready for the first coming of Jesus. He was no indolent pensioner. He was active. And that's the kind of older gentleman going to be ready for the return of Jesus. Miriam from Nazareth. Blessed among women, that's the kind of teenage girl ready for the first coming of Jesus. That's the kind of teenage girl going to be ready for his return. Joseph, that's the kind of young man, righteous and just, ready for the first coming of Jesus. That's the kind of young man going to be ready for his return. Zachariah and his wife Elizabeth, a faithful clergyman and a corrupt clergy, a voice of truth and righteousness, and a corrupt, morally bankrupt and spiritually abject religious system, totally backslidden, the same as the Methodists are backslidden, and the Anglicans are backslidden. Slidden, and the Southern Baptists are backslidden, is the same. Yeah. Shepherds will watch their flock in the night. Boy, it's the way it was. One here, two there. Those are the kinds of people ready for the first coming of Jesus. Those are the kinds of Jews and Gentiles ready for the first coming of Jesus. And those are going to be the kind who are going to be ready for his second coming. My prayer this holiday season for my family and for yours is always the same. It's that we and our families would be among them. No matter how corrupt the religious system and denominations become. The righteous clergy would stay righteous. That he was holy, be holy still. That's my prayer. For the Simeons, for the Annas, for the Good Shepherds, for the Josephs, for the Midians. For the Zacharias and the Elizabeths, for you and for me, for your family and for mine. No, the nativity is not only or even mainly about the first coming of Jesus. It's about his second coming. My dear brethren in Christ, let us all be clear about something. Christmas is coming. Christ returneth. God bless and thank you so much for listening. Jacob, thank you so much. That's a very in-depth message tonight. And I know people probably were sharpening their pencils during that, taking copious notes. 
I'm you sorry, we're not so long, but it's a no? big subject. Well, I'm guessing you might be a bit dry. So take, take a break for a second, because I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. I know I had questions, and then suddenly you said something else, and the question changed, and you said something else, and I thought of another question as we go along. But you said something that was quite interesting, and you presented it in a way that I didn't expect, and probably a lot of other people didn't expect, or maybe perhaps they didn't pick up on it. And you said this. We are not looking for the church to join the world. The world is looking to join the church. They see the church, as did Constantine, as a means, as an instrument to actually gain control. Yes. So our enemy isn't <coughs> society itself. The ecumenical uh, agenda is no longer a secret. It's full-blown. It's there. It's, it's, it's embedded. But the world, whether it's commerce, whether it's governmental, whether it's medical or whatever, will be coming in bed with the church to use the church. And that example of the Lord and his earthly parents finding no room in the inn suddenly becomes very apparent to me. We no longer have room in the inn because we right. don't speak the same language as the majority of the denominations. Would you agree with that or do you have to expand on it slightly? I would absolutely agree. Mm. No room in the inn has <laughs> no room in the church for faithful Christians very often. They're getting no. kicked out left and right. Very true. You stand for truth and righteousness. A lot of churches aren't going to want you anymore. That's real, so true. Thank you, Jacob. Anyone got any questions for Jacob? <coughs> if you have, just unmute your microphone and just uh, take the, the pulpit by the, both hands. It's got to be about tonight's subject, though. Jeanette, you're on muting your microphone. Have you got a question? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know if it's too theoretical, but I wondered, you know, about the um, genealogy uh, with Mary, because I was thinking about the time in um, 2 Chronicles 22, I think it's in 2 Kings as well, uh, when Queen Athaliah was, you know, yeah. took over, and Jehoshiba... The sister of, you know, the daughter of the king. Yes. Uh, rescued Joash, who was the only one to survive. Correct. And directly. She was, yeah, she was the wife of the high priest. Correct. So that is a prophetic king. foreshadowing of the rescue of Christ. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. Cor you're absolutely correct. We, we talked that on some other tape a long time ago, but you're, you're correct. We have it on the tape. I just couldn't tell you which one. Yes, yeah, so I thought it might be a bit far fetched. But no, no, no. It's not far fetched at all. You're exactly right. Thank you. You're, it, it's a type. Now, we don't base doctrine on type, but the types yeah. illustrate the doctrine. You're exactly correct. Very insightful. The Lord must have shown you, but you're correct. Well, Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you for putting I up. got all my bits of paper and my pen. <laughs> I tried to make it my notes. So. Thank you. That's good stuff. Thank you, Jeanette. Bless you. Anyone else? Any, any further questions? Uh, Amos, this is Terry. I have a question. Hi, Terry. Yeah, Jacob. Uh, could you comment on the signs or the symbols that are in Revelation 12, 15, and 16? Did you get that question, Jacob? I think I did. I thought I kind of answered it more or less, but let me look. Not quite. Specifically 15 and 16. Yeah. Well, he's talking about the this. The serpent poured out water like a river. Yes. Of the mouth of the woman that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river, which the dragon poured out of his mouth. Okay, please pay attention. Most of our people have heard this, but I'll say it again in order to answer the question. Satan has two modes of attack, the dragon and the serpent, okay? The serpent beguiled the woman. When Satan attacks by deception, he is manifested in the character of the serpent. Remember what Paul said in 2 uh, Corinthians? I fear that as the serpent uh, deceived, beguiled Eve, you're being beguiled. When Satan attacks the church or attacks a believer by means of deception, that is his manifestation and the character of a serpent. Okay. When he persecutes, that is his manifestation in the dragon. 
Now notice what you have in Revelation 12. We deal with this on, well, our previous two editions ago of our quarterly, the mini apocalypse of Isaiah, we deal with this. The dragon morphs into the serpent and the serpent morphs into the dragon, but they're the same. Okay. Now, if you can follow it, the dragon has more to do with the one we call the Antichrist. The serpent has more to do with the one we call the false prophet. Okay? But they're the same. <clears throat> it's a diabolical counterfeit of the Trinity. Satan, the Antichrist, and false prophet. Okay? <laughs> now, <clears throat> One beast comes from the earth and one from the sea. The sea has to do with the Gentile nations of the Mediterranean basin. The earth in biblical imagery has more to do with Israel. Somehow the Messiah, I'm sorry, the man-child, the, the way Christ was protected, okay, and went into Egypt, okay, is a picture of the way Israel is going to be protected at the close of the age and any believers who get saved then, although it'll be a death sentence, I mean, Satan's going to kill him, kill him. He will not completely succeed. The earth, somehow they're going to be a respite in part for some people. A number of people believe, and they have good reason to believe, that this relates to the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 16, of what's called Bosra, today it's called Petra, that there will be a literal flight of believers who were saved at that time, after the rapture now, okay. who will go to Petra and wait for Christ to return. It is interesting to note, as we mentioned last week, that there are portions of Jordan that we are told do not come under the direct domain of the Antichrist. Okay? Areas of Moab and Edom that do not come under his domain. It might be part of the peace deal he brokers or whatever. But an escape. This may be correspond i'm being semi-speculative here it right. may have to do with that the believers who say this seem to have a point okay that there'll be some kind of a uh refugee evacuation of believers into petra before christ returns from israel that's the best i can explain it in a nutshell i hope that helps yes it does thank you okay thank you terry Jacob, just on the subject of symbolism, we know across the church some people will celebrate Christmas at various degrees. Some will totally not celebrate Christmas because they see it as symbolic. They see it as pagan in many ways. And we respect both sides of that. Each, each person celebrates the Lord where, where the heart leads. But just on what Terry saying on symbolism, how cautious should we be to... Christmas symbolisms, whether it's the tree itself, was it the star, is it the angel, all the things that go around. I know Christians who won't need a hot cross bun because they say it's pagan. Yeah. How cautious should we be, or should we just simply just be a little bit of a bit common sense in this? If you take these things purely culturally, it is one thing. When you ascribe or attribute some kind of spiritual or theological or religious significance to them is another be it mistletoe or a tree or whatever. Now, I don't have that stuff. In my, my family, <laughs> yesterday we had Hanukkah with my grandson. You know, I mean, that we, fortunately, my family was Israeli. We have Hanukkah. It's not an issue to us. But <clears throat> if it's purely cultural, I don't care. It's a matter of your own choice and conscience. But if any religious properties or attributes are ascribed to these things. <laughs> it is bad. The other problem is 
Well, they were claiming that they're celebrating the nativity. They're really a danger of their worshiping mammon. It becomes about materialism. And these emblems, as you put it, they tend to divert Christians' focus away from what they claim to believe Christmas is, the nativity, into what the world does. I wouldn't care if Christmas was never celebrated again, as long as the nativity is celebrated whatever day, I don't care. But there is another element to this. The banning you see where Muslim groups in England, and it's happening in America, are objecting to Christian to Christmas decorations or anything pointing to the cross or any Christian symbolism on public land. Okay? Of course, the Muslims are allowed to have their Ramadan, but if there's any kind of a cross or a Christian symbol on public land, they're litigating. They're suing. And it's not just the Muslims, the atheist groups. The war on Christmas is not so much a war against the nativity being perverted into something materialistic. The war on Christmas in the popular media is an attack on any expression of Christianity in Western culture. So while I don't care about Christmas myself, we just go, well, we, if there was no COVID, we would. We just go to church to the carol service, that's all. And we do some charity things, that's all. We have Hanukkah. But um, I realize that these people who are bringing these lawsuits and things, they're trying to de-Christianize the Western world. And mark my words, once they get the Christ, they're going to go after the Jews. <laughs> no, I, I'd agree. It's interesting tonight we have Chris Chop with us again. Chris Chop, if, if you just take this question from me to you, I know certainly as regards the EU and Brexit here in the UK, with only a few days still to go before we start putting out the Christmas bunting and waving goodbye, as it were. But I know certainly Poland and Hungary have, have been digging their heels in recently because of pressure by the EU in relation to the ecumenical um, push to bring in and normalize Islam within those two countries. And I just wonder, obviously, uh, Christoph, Poland is a traditionally Catholic country, but its, right. its standards and its cultural understanding of what Christian is is still very strong. And I think you guys are, are not going to concede this at all, are you really? You're going to dig your heels in. Actually, the thing is that uh, uh, Poland is really a uh, tradition, uh, tradition uh, uh, the deep tradition of Polish country is really Catholic Church, right? Uh, and I spent there uh, more than 10 years looking for Jesus, actually, because I really started to look for Jesus in 2005. And then this is obvious thing in Poland when you're looking for God, it is you are looking at in a Catholic Church, because this is the only way that you can find it here, right? So, uh, this tradition here is very, very strong, and it is not quite uh, easy to find, you know, um, the ev evangelical church that is sharing the gospel the right way, the biblical way, right? Mm. Is it the answer for your question? No, it, it is. I was just wondering the reality at this time of the year where Poland and most of Europe does like to celebrate Christmas, Weihnacht and Nikolaus or whatever attribute they put to it, because they do also, as well as all the festive side of it, realize their religious significance. And as you say, you're traditionally Catholic, yeah. but you still recognize that's the birth of Jesus coming into the world. It's not yeah. anything else. It's purely simply that with all the trimmings, but it is the birth of Christ. Yes, it is the this birth of Christ, and actually, all people are concentrated, you know, in a, with a little baby, you know, in the church. This yeah. is this is the obvious thing that we can find here. Actually, I look forward, you know, to um, uh, on uh, more understanding about the Jewish uh, festivals that we need to understand that God wants to show us something about Jesus, right? But uh, the main tradition here. 
uh, mainly uh, does not have anything in common with those things that are written in the Bible. This is this yeah. is obvious. No, that's very interesting. Thank you, Christoph. Renato, oh, before we went to our recording Sorry. tonight, you mentioned some issues that were local to you in uh, Edmonton, and some of the pressures were being brought to you from your pastors and your church. Having heard the message you've heard tonight, does that reinforce the pressure you realize you're getting on? Do you understand why now that you're being put under so much pressure and what's being used against you by your own pastor? That's for Renata, Renata Lowry. Yes, yes, yeah, I hear that. Oh, yeah, I mean, I mean, everything that I'm learning here from Jacob, and uh, I'm just realizing that I had to really step back. And also, I don't know if Jacob heard, but the junior pastor, I had a conversation with him on a messenger, Facebook messenger, and um, he was basically saying, you can take the mark of the beast and still be saved. And and he ended up unfriending me, you know, and he also didn't like the fact that I pointed out from scripture that there will be false Christ, false prophets, you know, false teachers. And he he was, uh, what is it, um, offended by that. And he also was offended by all Bibles. He said all Bibles are, um, are the word of God, which I said, no, I told him the message was garbage. And, you know, I, I did that. So I could really see it was really hard for me to step back from this church because you know, Jacob, you say, they're nice people. They were so nice people. And it, uh, when I had to step back, I felt like I was breaking up with a boyfriend. Like, that's mm. how much I cared about these people. And it was really tough. But I just really appreciate this group. And I appreciate so much what I'm learning. Because, I mean, I I don't think, I it's, the whole, it's like the whole Bible is opening up to me. Like, it is never before. And I just want to thank you very much. And and thank well, you listen, for being able to be here. I once broke off with my girlfriend, but I ended up marrying her anyway. <laughs> <laughs> can I go back to Christo for a second? He can correct me if I'm wrong. Sobieski? Jan Sobieski. I got yeah, this, I this in Poland at, oh, at his really? palace in Warsaw. Not the one in Krakow. It's his house in Warsaw Palace. It's a museum, and I bought this there. Poland is very much framed by its history. Most people in the West don't know, had it not been for the Poles, Islam would have conquered most of continental Europe. They would have, they came up to the Balkans, they reached the outskirts of Vienna, they were going into Eastern Europe, and they were going into, about to invade Central Europe. At different times in history, one time was with Charles Martel in Western Europe, stopped the Islamic invasions and the Saracens were stopped in Italy. And then another time, it was the Khazar Empire who converted to Judaism in the area of the Caucasus topic. But in Central Europe, it was Jan Sobieski, it was the Poles. The Poles, strategically, from a military perspective, saved Western civilization from the Islamic invasion that came up from Turkey. And the Poles know this, and they're proud of their history. And that's also a factor in their thinking about their resistance to Islam. They were the people of Europe who fought Islam. Would you say I'm right, Christo? Yes, this is absolutely correct. Yeah, this is sure. true. <laughs> Don't thank you for me. Thank you for my Polish cousin over there. But, yeah. Thank you for mentioning about that. There was one area of Poland in the Reformation. Again, even Christians in Poland, I'm surprised, don't know this. <clears throat> the area of Silesia, Silesia, Silesia. Sure. Silesia. The Reformation did get into that area of Poland with, with a, a preacher called Kasper Schwenkenfeld. Kasper Schwenkenfeld. <coughs> and there was a large evangelical movement of people being saved out of Roman Catholicism in Silesia <coughs> during and just after the Reformation. So part of the Reformation, and I, I'm not a big fan of the Reformation, but there were good preachers in it. And one of them was Schwenkenfeld. And the gospel did make it a major inroad into Poland, that area of Poland at that time. It's worth oh, that's interesting. Poland. It's worth reading it's if you're Polish. Thank you for advice. I certainly look for that. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Christoph. Kayan, I believe you're waiting with a question. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? All right. Good evening, Kayan. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to um, 
asked Jacob Crash to clarify something for me about pre-tribulationism. Um, because I do worry about pre-tribulationism because of the fact that, you know, a lot of people, when they realise the Antichrist is going to come and we're going to face tribulation, a lot of them might, you know, be fearful and fall away. And one thing I want to ask is, is if I was to ask like a traditional pre-tribulationist like Arnold Frutabom or Mark Hitchcock, I was just wondering, how would they sort of safeguard themselves against that sort of worry that, you know, if the rapture doesn't happen for tribulation, that we're going to have to face it? I know both, both Mark Hitchcock and Arnold Fruchtenbaum. Mark Hitchcock is a traditional pre-tribulationist. Arnold Fruchtenbaum has modified his position to say that the apostasia, the apostasy in Second Thessalonians 2 could be a spatial departure, which very much surprised me that he said that. Mark Hitchcock not. Mark Hitchcock says if it was a spatial departure, in other words, if the apostasy in Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians is the rapture, the word would be harpezo. I agree with Mark Hitchcock. So you have to understand there's a division among pre-tribulationists themselves between the traditional ones and the newfangled ones who say the apostasy is the rapture. Well, why does that happen? Well, because they have an obvious dilemma with the text of 2 Thessalonians. In both Greek and in any good translation, the clearest reading and meaning is that the rapture won't happen until the Antichrist is identified. They have to do all kinds of reductio ad absurdum argumentation to get around the plain meaning of the text. They also have to engage in hyper-dispensationalism, even though they otherwise wouldn't be hyper-dispensational. This comes from Darby. They have to go to Darbyism. Dar not for Christians. Darby said, this is a close brethren they're called, Darby said the Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians, it's for unsaved Jews. Well, Darby then said the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, is not for Christians, it's for unsaved Jews. <laughs> now if you were to ask these same people, do you think the Epistle of James is for Christians? Oh yeah. Do you think that the Sermon on the Mount is for, also for Christians? Yeah. Not just for Jews. No, it's for Christians. Well, then why not Matthew 24? They, they're not consistent in their own hermeneutic. They move the goalpost. <laughs> There's yeah. a lot of problems. It's a huge subject. We do have a film clip made by Alan Kirshner and by Charles Cooper and some people like that on the Moriel TV and on RTN TV uh, that you can watch that deals with the basic problems you're raising. But we also have other teachings, like the great myth, and there's something just called questions for my pre-trib friends. Uh, the early Christians did not believe such nonsense. It's an invention of the 19th century. Yeah, I was surprised you met, I'm surprised Arnold Bourbon changed his position, actually, because- So was I. Because um, when I was thinking about, you know, pre tribulation and the dangers it has, I watched um, a video on RTN about you going over the apostasy, not being the rapture. And you mentioned that Arthur Fribon originally believed that before the rapture happens, we have to identify the Antichrist. So I thought, okay, if that's what they believe, then that's reasonable enough. I mean, at least then we still have to recognize Antichrist first. Yeah, before, yeah, yeah, but that before the mind. tribulation, not necessarily before the rapture. You know what I mean? Oh. As he would see it. So repeat that, sorry? Arnold would say, okay, it has to happen before the tribulation, but not before the rapture. Okay. The Antichrist will have to be identified before the tribulation. Does not yeah. mean he has to be identified before the rapture. <laughs> Uh, that, that's what Arnold would. You can contact him on REL Ministries and ask him the question. I don't want to speak for him, but I was totally, totally flabbergasted that he 
flipped his position to go with those people. <coughs> he was always a Charles Ryrie type pre-tribulationist. Well, that's what saddens me, I think. It's just, <coughs> there's a lot of these positions, I feel, where like, you, you, have, you, have, you know, you have good believers who hold to positions. And I just think to myself, how do you deal with this? Because I feel like there's there's so much danger in sometimes in these positions. Like, I mean, another example would just be like, you know, double <coughs> position, where it changes how people will view God's justice because, you know, they think, you know, you free this people to hell. And it's like, well, that's not true. And if you tell an atheist that, that's, again, dangerous. And it's the same with pre tribulationism where people who think they're not going to experience suffering, and then they do, might lose their faith. And it's like, that's what correct. do you think? Like, how do you... Again, how does all the, you know, let's, let's look at about... the subject on, on the first coming of Christ and nativity. There was confusion. Hmm. Not everybody had a clear picture. Most people did not have a clear picture. Isaiah tells us there'll be a lot of occult activity, but also a lot of conspiracy theories. Just look at the situation Israel had at his first coming, and it's what's happening today. Mm. There's all kinds of... Look, the, the, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees said, have you not heard no prophet comes from Galilee? Well, wait a minute. Jonah did. <laughs> you know what I mean? He was from Galilee. <coughs> they didn't know the scriptures well, and they were the experts. Well... That's the way it was then. That's the way it is now. Uh, I'm just glad that I'm just glad that God has given us the grace to be the few people who are able to pass this out. At least, yes, correct. You know, again, thank God for that. And um, speaking of signs, actually, I actually did want to ask David Wilkerson. I actually really like a lot of David Wilkerson stuff. And one of the things I was curious about is, do you think all the riots and fires that happened, like around George Floyd at the time, and continuing today? Do you think that was a fulfillment of the prophecy he gave? Yeah, he saw he this stuff it? in the book he wrote in the 70s called The Vision. I, I knew David Wilkerson. I didn't know him well, but I knew him personally. And I knew his son, Gary, quite well. Um, <coughs> he wrote that book in the 70s. And it, it would vindicate him as somebody who spoke prophetically and accurately, I would say. Okay? Um, but we got to keep the questions relative to tonight's subject. Okay, yeah, sorry. Thank you, Kayan. Good question, though. Rebecca, you you unmuted your microphone. Did you have a question? Rebecca? No? Anyone else got any questions for Jacob? Just yes, if it's possible, I would love to ask one question. Please, please oh, thank you so much. Dear Jacob, I have a question about Ephraim. Would you please explain uh, how do you see this subject? Because um, I wanted to ask you about the prophecy Jacob prophecy when he gives the blessings for Manasseh and okay. uh, Ephraim uh, crossed hands, right? Yes. Please. That's not tonight's subject. Okay, that's okay. Ephraim means different things in different contexts. Sometimes Ephraim is a metaphor for the ten northern tribes collectively. Sometimes it's specifically the tribe of Ephraim. Uh, Ephraim means tw doubly fruitful or twice fruitful. That's what it means. Um, but it's used to mean different things in different contexts. The suffering servant of Isaiah 53, this is Jesus, is called in the rabbinic literature, ancient rabbinic literature, Ben Ephraim. Ben Ephraim. Um, it, it is a widely used term that means different things in different contexts both in the scriptures and in Judaism. But I'm sorry, I, okay. I've got to stick to tonight's. <laughs> Thank you. Chris. Thank you so much. Anybody else got any questions related to the teaching tonight on Christmas? Is that uh, Ms. O Ms. O'Donnell? You got yeah. Um, in regards, I know, uh, Jacob, you said the lineage of um, Mary and Joseph in regards to Yeshua being both from the Levitic priesthood and the Davidic was rather extensive, but I wanted to just see if you have written about it in any of your books. We have some of them here. I have a bit, but I, what I really need to do is a go back to the book of Ruth. The, the clo well, we have a teaching on Ruth already, but beginning with Ruth chapter 4, 
work through the genealogies in Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, and I'm sorry, Ezra and Second Chronicles of the return from Babylon, and then look at Luke and Matthew in light of each other in contrast to the Old Testament genealogies in Genesis, Ruth, Ezra, Nehemiah. It would be quite a project, and I would have to devote maybe two, two, two it'd be a long teaching like tonight's, you know. Yeah. Okay, where, where are you based? Uh, uh, South Carolina. Tyler and I, we're friends with, uh, we joined Sandy Simpson's church. Oh, so okay, we, you, you don't sound like you're originally from the South. No, we actually moved from Long Island, and I'm originally from Pennsylvania. Okay, where in Pennsylvania? In Laura Marion, the main line. I don't know if you're familiar. Yeah, I know I go Paoli that way. Yeah, exactly. Not far from Paoli, right along. Yeah. Okay, you know, well, there. thank you for joining us. Every blessing. Absolutely. Give Sandy a big kiss on the forehead for me, all right? We will on Sunday, definitely. All right. You'll have to take your mask off first. <laughs> Well, unless there's any other questions from anybody, I don't see any of them other microphones. I think we've more or less exhausted. Amos, one, one anyone follow. ask any final question? Terry. Yes, I have a question yes. here. Uh, Jacob, could you go back to Just put it on mute because I want to ask a question. Earlier with respect to the census, I, I as I heard you, you said that you said basically there were two censuses separated in time. Both were attempts to um, you know, represent assigning a number to people. And right. I got confused between two census. Uh, could you okay. clarify? There's a historical record of two. Luke says the first census. That tells us there was a second one. There is a tech, uh, historical problem reconciling the timing of Luke with Matthew. You understand? Uh, uh, okay. Gotcha. But it can be explained by the variation in the two different census. The main point for us is why it was done and who it was done by and what it what it's a shadow of typologically. We don't, again, base doctrine on type, but it does show us what's going to happen. It illustrates it. Got okay. It. What, there was one more brother had a question. Yeah, uh, Mark Thomas was uh, waiting patiently. Okay. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, Mark. Um, thank, Hello, Mark. Hi, Jacob. Um, can I just start by saying that I thank God uh, for your ministry. I've been um, following your ministry for three decades now and um, I just thank God for you um, it's just a, a comment really and an observation from what you were saying regarding the, the nativity in terms of um, the sign of Jesus his first coming and the sign of his second yes. coming um, in the sign of his first coming it was mainly the um, Christmas star um, that was the the sign from what I can see yes. and, and in his second coming the Bible talks about you know um, you know, just like when lightning strikes from from the east and the west, people will see. So will the sign of the Son of Man be correct? That's, um, that, that's it. Yeah, and I, I see that sign as the Shekinah glory of God. That's what we're going to see first Many in people terms do. of you're Jesus' not the only sign. One, you're not the only one who believes that. Yeah, uh, Arnold Fruchtbaum believes it's the Holy Spirit. Um, yeah, and my question is, Jacob, is that um, would you concur that the the, the sign of the Shekinah glory in, in Christ's second coming, is, 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 is there a correlation with the Christmas star? Um, please rephrase your question. He's asking, yeah. is there any connection between the star which the wise men followed in comparison to what the sign might be on the Lord's second return? Absolutely. One is a type of the other. The sign of, of the stars, it's called, is a type of what's going to be seen at the close of the age when they see the sign of the son of man there was a sign of his first coming and a sign of his second one is the type or the shadow of the other absolutely does that answer the question yeah it, it does um yeah now, whether or not it's the shekinah that's another issue um some people do think that and you're not the only one who, who has that view I, arnold has that view other, there are people who think that I'm not prepared to be conclusive about it at this point. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, and that, that thoroughly answers my question because in essence, that's what I was asking about the Christmas star, Jacob, whether you see that as the Shekinah glory of God. Uh, again, you've got a problem because 
where else in the Bible is the Holy Spirit? See, the Shekinah, the word Shekinah, Shekinah, okay, has to do with an imminent or positional dwelling. You know, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word is kataskeno in Greek, and it's simply the Greek translation of Shekinah or tabernacled among us. So a star is in the sky, a tabernacle is uh, something on that's terrestrial. Okay. So how are you going to, how can you conclusively or dogmatically say it's the Shekinah? Shekinah means it, it's tabernacled. It's tabernacled. Okay. Where do you get this idea of a celestial tabernacle per se? The New Jerusalem doesn't have a temple, we're told. Um, where do you get it? This is the problem. I don't know of any other scriptural precedent to have a tabernacle that is in any sense astral or cosmic, cosmological. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I get that, and, and that's a, a valid point that you make, yeah. um, Jacob. Now, I'm not saying these people are, that you were wrong. I'm just saying I can't be dogmatic about it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank Good you very question, much, Jacob. Though, Mark. I must be honest, it's provoked me to think around those ideas as well. I'm not an astrologist, but I don't know then, Jacob, if there's any mileage when we look at the subject matter tonight of Christmas and this winter time, as it is certainly in our hemisphere, is that an indication that the Lord's return may be in winter time, or would that be reading too far into it? Again, Jesus said, you know the seasons. But by knowing the seasons, okay, the closest thing Scripture comes to Describe associating his return with meteorological seasons. Okay. The bridegroom in the Song of Solomon came in the springtime for the bride. Yeah. Okay. That was that. But then the, the, the second harvest, the autumn harvest, um, with, with the Feast of Tabernacles which is a picture of the millennial reign of Christ, according to Zechariah. That's in the autumn. So, go figure. You, it, it, you have two different passages that, are, that relate to the return of Christ, at least in figure, but they're for two different seasons. No, good answer, man. I always try and quantify these questions by... The follow-up scripture that he doesn't come when we think he's going to come. That's correct. So even if we thought oh, yeah, it must be in winter time, November, December, actually it might come in July. You know, we're never going to figure it out. See, don't forget also, as we looked at the week before last, it's a variable. He sends the harvest when the crop permits. Yes, so he's waiting on us. Yes, so it's it's a it, God knows an eternity. But relative to us, it's a variable. Yeah, absolutely. Tommy, you've been waiting for a question. Yes. Um, first of all, I'm just really thankful to be a part of this group. Can you speak a little louder, please? Um, I'll take off my earpiece. Can you hear me? Better, yes. Okay. Um, I'm just really thankful for this ministry and that God has led me to you guys. Well, thank you for joining us. Where are you based? Of, of Word of Faith, and that years ago participated in um, Assemblies of God. And I haven't been to a church for about 10 years. So I'm really thankful that he's shown me where I was erring and led me to you guys. Just God bless like, you. Where are you based? I'm in Boring, Oregon. You're in Oregon. Are you near Bend, Oregon? Uh, it's it's quite a ways from there. It's uh -huh. closer to Portland, about Close 20 before. miles from Portland. Uh -huh. You know, even if you met with four other believers in a house who are like-minded, some fellowship is better than no fellowship. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And my question is regarding the star. Um, is there anything in the Old Testament that is like a type of that? Well, yeah, there's the prophecy. I think that? it's in Numbers. I, I wasn't expecting the question. I, it's not something I've looked at often. 
Number six. No, it's not it. Twenty-three. Number six. Did you say twenty-three, Tim? I think yeah. I was looking at it the other day. I'm sure. I just. I uh, thought it's... it was twenty-three. Um, I'm just skipping there now. Um, Excuse me. Um, I, I should know that. I should really know it. But it was twenty-four. I think seventeen. I got uh, to, to uh, search. Yeah, 24, Yeah, 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 I got it, 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob, which is national Israel, and a scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab and tear down all the sons of Sheth. Um, star that will come forth from Jacob. Yeah, that's that's the one. Thank okay. you so much. I forgot Thank where you. I put it. <laughs> Thank you, Tommy. Well, it looks like our final question have, is from one, Pyro. I have a question there. I have a question there. Go on, Eric. Um, the first, I have two of them. It, it's short, relatively short, um, pertaining to what we spoke about today. The first one is, how old was Miriam when she had the Lord? That's the first question. How old was Mary, how old was Mary when she had the Lord? Nobody knows, but likely, likely a teenager. Okay. And the second one is in Luke, in, in the passage of Luke, uh, in the Olivet Discord in, in Luke 21. Right. That, that part of scripture, when he says, and there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and on the earth, distress of nations and perplexity. Uh, the word stars being translated aster, right? Correct. Yes. In Greek. Given the fact that in, in the last couple of years, more activity in, the, in, the, in space with near-Earth objects, is that also something for us as believers to pay attention to, that the Lord is coming and he's imminent because of the activity of asteroids, stars? Okay, there, are, <clears throat> there is a good argument, logically and theologically, to be made that when a third of the sea is life is destroyed when an object from space hits it. Yeah. In Revelation, it will be difficult to make that to be anything other than a meteor. Um, there are meteors around, like uh, the one, there's one in Hawaii that's incredible on top of the mountain. There's another one in Israel. Um, in the, in, the, in the negative, in, and it's huge. Um, what, and there was one that hit Siberia at one time. They can cause major meteorological changes temporarily to the Earth's climate yeah. as a result of the explosion that they cause. Um, don't forget the, the, the physics there. Their weight relative to the Earth increases as they come into the gravitational pull of the Earth. So the, even these smaller objects can do incredible damage. Uh, you know, a media the size of a car can, <laughs> can make a, a pretty big cavity. Um, so it will be difficult to see that prophecy and revelation with the wormwood not, not being something meteoric. But it is for sure that astral phenomena will increase. The basis of this and what Luke 21 was talking about all relates back to Joel chapter 2. It all comes from the second chapter of Joel. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you for your question. Thank you, Eric. Tim, you've got the final honors tonight with your question. Tim Ayers. Oh, oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, really, uh, just an interesting comment, Jacob, on Simeon. Um, that's really helpful. Would you suggest that some people, um, if, if you like, have a whole lifetime of preparation for just five, ten minutes or years visibility, but nonetheless it has significance for the extension of the kingdom? Well, yeah, I'm not saying God didn't use Simeon before that. I'm simply saying those five minutes were the climax. Sure. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.